Simplify your world. Simplify your life. Think simply, like scientists do. Simple models, simple systems on Science Without Walls. are beginning the next 10% of this course. This program and the three that follow deal with the basic concepts and themes of science. Science is based on the assumption that the laws, the rules which underlie the natural world are the same throughout the universe. What we measure and learn here on Earth will apply on Venus or Jupiter or even in another galaxy. What we do in my lab in Salt Lake City can be reproduced in labs in Paris, Moscow, Melbourne, or Oslo. Sure, there are local differences, temperature, pressure, even gravity, and environmental conditions, all of which may influence our measurements and observations. But the underlying physical laws and principles are the same, everywhere. You see, we can't turn off science. We cannot table it, we cannot postpone it, we cannot ignore it, just because we may not like its results or outcomes. The basic laws and principles apply, whether we're doing chemistry or physics, geology or biology, or even cosmology. They even apply in Congress in Washington, D.C., although many of our elected officials like to ignore those scientific laws and principles. Although there are many things yet to be discovered, and there may be new principles and forces of which we are now unaware, much of the natural world is understood. The fundamental laws are known. And that's why there is so much interest today in science and in science education. The University of Utah's former president, David Pierpont Gardner, was appointed chairman of the National Commission on Education in the early 1980s. In April 1983, President Gardner, on behalf of the commission, presented its report, A Nation at Risk. Most government documents are forgotten shortly after they're produced. A Nation at Risk was a very different document. It was written in a manner, presented in a style, and delivered at a time that were all fortuitous. It is a landmark document that led to major changes in education, which are now being widely implemented. This course and this series of programs is but one example. The report begins, and I'll be quoting, Our nation is at risk. The educational foundations of our society are presently being eroded by a rising tide of mediocrity that threatens our very future as a nation and as a people. If an unfriendly foreign power had attempted to impose on America the mediocre educational performance that exists today, we might well have viewed it as an act of war. As it stands, we have allowed this to happen to ourselves. We have, in effect, been committing an act of unthinking unilateral educational disarmament. Our society and its educational institutions seem to have lost sight of the basic purposes of schooling, of the high expectations and disciplined effort required to obtain them. The report goes on. History is not kind to idlers. Individuals in our society who do not possess the levels of skills, literacy, and training essential to this new era will be effectively disenfranchised, not simply from the material rewards that accompany competent performance, but also from the chance to participate fully in our national life. A high level of shared education is essential to a free democratic society and to the fostering of a common culture. For our country to function, citizens must be able to reach some common understandings on complex issues, often on short notice and on the basis of conflicting or incomplete evidence. Education helps form these common understandings. The report continues. 
more and more young people emerge from high school neither ready for college nor for work. And the report argues for excellence, for performing at the boundary of individual ability in ways that test and expand personal limits. Excellence sets high expectations and goals for all learners and then tries in every possible way to help students reach them. Excellence characterizes a society that has adopted these policies. Our goal must be to develop the talents of all to their fullest, to expect and assist all students to work to the limits of their capabilities. The report concludes exactly the way it begins. America is at risk. This report came at a difficult economic time for this country. We were comparing ourselves to other industrialized nations. We were worried about our economic viability the competitiveness of our industries, the quality of our schools. The report spawned considerable national soul-searching, discussion, and study, and much of that has been positive. There is good news. Education has improved. The quality of teachers and their salaries have improved. But the improvements have not yet been dramatic. Utah still ranks at the bottom nationally in dollars per student for education. A nation at risk could just as well have issued yesterday. Practically every word in all of its conclusions and recommendations would remain unchanged. Other good news, however, is that new resources have been allocated for science education. Although, unfortunately, no such resources have been allocated in the arts. Thanks to another report, this one in 1989, titled Science for All Americans, almost every state in the nation has revised its expectations and plans for the teaching of science, including Utah. Utah has adopted a revised and enhanced science curriculum for elementary and high schools. It's based on hands-on experiments and experience-based learning. I've been on your wrist all, all the way back there, okay? And then down, down, okay. But our colleges and universities, who should be the leaders in these efforts, have really done very little so far. Science for All Americans is about scientific literacy. It contains a set of recommendations on what understandings and ways of thinking are really essential for all citizens in a world shaped by science and technology. It emphasizes basic concepts and themes. And these are not unique to science. These concepts and themes include systems, models, scale, constancy, change, matter, energy, disorder, and life. We'll deal with each of those concepts and themes in these next four programs. They are also applicable to social systems, and they're applicable to the fine arts. They're applicable to the humanities, to all areas of inquiry and activity. And that's not surprising. Everything that we do is in some way constrained by or facilitated by the natural world. Understanding the natural world objectively and rationally is the domain of science. So it's no surprise to realize that key scientific concepts or themes go far beyond science. They would not be part of science if they did not. Most of science is indeed common sense, at least by hindsight. In Einstein's words, the whole of science is nothing more than a refinement of everyday thinking. The first of the nine basic concepts is system. There are ecosystems and monetary systems, medical systems and educational systems. Systems generally have functions, borders, and boundaries that permit us to focus, to direct or concentrate our attention. A system is a collection of things that influence one another, that appear to constitute some whole. The university is an educational system. Your family is a social system. Scientists worry about how systems interact with each other. The components within a system interact with other components, processes, or parts of that system. 
Systems may have inputs and outputs, presumably to and from other systems. Consider the Earth, our beautiful blue planet, as an entire system. Earth is an isolated system. We can't leave it. Normally other things or beings don't come into it. Earth as a system does have inputs, primarily energy from the sun. And it has some outputs, primarily the space probes and the radio waves we send out. Liftoff, we have a liftoff, 32 minutes past the hour. Liftoff on Apollo 11. Your automobile is another system. You put fuel in and it performs work. It transforms the chemical energy from fuel to the mechanical energy of movement, getting you from place to place. It also has a chemical output in the form of the exhaust gases and other waste products. Your house is a system. Your apartment is a system. If you're a biologist or ecologist, your system might be the Great Salt Lake, or it might be some small lake somewhere in the mountains, or something even smaller. You might divide your system into subsystems, which you can then study more conveniently and in more detail. Medicine and physiology are well organized in systems. There's the digestive system, the nervous system, the muscular system. There tends to be anatomical and functional bases for this organization. Muscles are anatomically distinguishable from other tissues. And muscles also have very specific functions. The practice of medicine is organized into specialties which focus on different systems. An ophthalmologist deals with the visual system. A nephrologist deals with the renal system, the kidneys and associated structures. And cardiologists deal with the cardiac system, the heart and its associated structures. Defining a system allows us to identify, to focus, to limit. Many systems are self-regulating. A good mechanical example is your house. Utah can get pretty cold in the winter, so you have a heating system. It gets hot in the summer, so you may have an air conditioning system. And these may even be connected together into some sort of environmental control system. You have sensors and controllers to help you regulate that internal environment, to keep the house temperature in a range which you find comfortable. You have a thermometer connected to the thermostat. So assuming your heating system is on and the temperature drops below the preset comfort range, the thermostat sends a signal and heat comes on. The heating system produces heat throughout the room of the house until the system senses a sufficiently high temperature. Then it sends another signal, turning the heating system off. So the inputs and outputs of a system not only include energy and material, but may also include information, such as the case of your thermostat. Scientists and engineers call this action feedback control. In environmental ecosystems, for example, Feedback can be very slow. Various prey and predator relationships, for example, may take many years to balance out. A computer system is an information-based input-output system. There is an energy input because you need some electricity to run the computer. And there is a little energy output, basically the heating produced by the computer's electronic components. There is some mechanical input pressing the keys on the keyboard or loading the disk. But there is very little mechanical output from the computer. There is information that goes in with your commands and typing, and a lot of information that comes out on the screen or via the printer. Systems can be very small or very large. A chemist may deal with individual molecules as systems. Stephen Hawking and other cosmologists deal with the entire universe as their system. The bigger the system, of course, generally the less detail in any of its individual or component parts. Try to look at the natural world from a system's perspective. You know, scientists are fundamentally pretty simple-minded. You've already seen that they are basically one to two-year-olds with a fairly good salary. And most scientists are humble folks. They know that they can't understand nature in all of its complexity. 
And that's why they focus on systems. So scientists try to take one piece of the natural world and concentrate on it. And even that's too complicated. So they simplify it as much as they possibly can. They make a model of their system. Model is another major concept and theme. A model is a great simplification, focusing on the really key and important parts and properties. The scientist, like the artist, develops a model of his or her system by throwing out and eliminating as much of the detail as she possibly can to focus only on the very major components, the key interactions, those parts which govern the behavior and properties of the system. Models can be physical, like model cars, boats, or airplanes. They can be mental. We often talk about mental models and mental pictures. And they can be mathematical, where the various relationships in the system are expressed in mathematical ways. And, of course, there are now computer models, which can be mathematical, graphical, visual, and multidimensional. With a model of the system in hand, you can ask questions of the model, formulate hypotheses, and use the model to help you do experiments. If you have an actual physical model of some sort of airplane, for example, you can make adjustments to the model, modify the wings, change the way it's launched, or even change the materials from which you constructed it. You can do experiments. You can use the model to predict behavior and then compare the behavior of the model with that of the real system. If it's a very good model, your system will tend to behave the way the model behaves, the way the model predicts. If it's not a good or accurate model, then it won't and you improve the model so that it has more predictive power. Another example is the weather. Weather is a complex, planet-wide system with many variables. Weather is a good example of a chaotic system, which means although you can predict it in the short term, it's very hard to predict it in the long term. Your favorite meteorologist uses weather models to help him predict the weather for you. His predictions are pretty good a day or two in advance. Not bad at three to five days in advance, and really pretty lousy beyond a week or so. Models need to be simple so we can study and understand them. Einstein said, science should be as simple as possible, but not simpler. So you see, we can't oversimplify to the point of being misleading. Models should be simple, but reasonable and useful. Models and simulations are now common in almost every area of science due to the availability of modern computers and the mathematical tools by which they can be used. For example, Dr. Chris Johnson in the Departments of Computer Science and Bioengineering models the electric fields on your chest produced by your heart's pacemaker and muscle. He can also simulate explosions, even nuclear explosions, on a computer. And we can even simulate the Big Bang of the universe, the birth and death of stars. Large modern jet aircraft are very complex and expensive objects to design, prototype, test, and manufacture. But we now understand the properties of materials, the science of aeronautics, and the behavior of airplanes so well that the Boeing 777, now widely used in commercial jet aviation, was never prototyped. A full-scale model was not built. It was entirely modeled and simulated on a computer. Boeing never required a test pilot for its 777. The test pilot flew the first plane off the production line with every expectation that it would work exactly as it had been designed and predicted with the help of computers. We can model and simulate processes and events which are so complex that they appear to be very realistic and so realistic that these models and simulations are now called virtual reality. Well, virtual means that it isn't really real, but because of the way it interacts with our senses, we perceive it as real. 
It can trigger an adrenaline rush, increase your heart rate and blood pressure, just as the real event can. But it's important to remember that no matter how much you sweat and no matter how much your heart pumps or how much you tingle in response to a virtual reality game or simulation, it isn't real. It's something generated on a computer which you sense visually and audibly and then your perception takes over. That's why we said earlier that we can't really trust our perceptions. Your brain uses your collective experience to process sensory information. It translates it and you sometimes perceive it as something it is not, like virtual reality. Virtual reality isn't real. It's not real reality, even if it sometimes feels like it. Systems and models are two of the key unifying concepts of science and of most other fields, including art. Define and look at a system, then try to model it, simplify it. That's what Leonardo did in trying to understand the human form and the anatomy and flight of birds. That helped him become a great scientist and artist. Getting to the very essence of an issue, of a problem, is really the same thing identify the issue, that's your system, try to strip away all its unessential complexity. What's left is a model of that issue, a model of that system. Try to do that with all of your issues and problems. Try to get to the heart, to the core of the problem and deal with that first. Next time we'll develop another key concept, scale. Prepare for a very wild ride. We'll see you then.